I think we're ready to get started. Thank you all for coming so early. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many of you here tonight. I'm Margaret Miller. I'm the director of the Institute for Research in Art, which includes the Contemporary Art Museum and Graphic Studio. And I invite all of you to stop by. Uh, we have a wonderful exhibition up currently called New Weather, curated by David Knorr. It will go through March 6th, and we we'll are always welcome you over at Graphic Studio between 9 and 5. Tonight, we're very excited to be recognizing and honoring an artist that we have worked rather extensively with at Graphic Studio, Christian Markley. And this is one of his images that you see on the screen. Christian Markley is an artist and musician whose work explores the relationship and connections between sound and images using a wide range of media, including hybrid objects, installation, video, sound collage, photography, and performance. He's a pioneer in experimenting, composing, and performing with records and turntables. He was born in California, raised in Switzerland, and now works between New York and London. He has an extensive exhibition and performance uh, record, including solo exhibitions at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington. He's participated in the Venice Biennale. Um, He's uh, also exhibited at the Hammer Museum at the University of California in Los Angeles, and he is represented by the Paula Cooper Gallery in New York and White Cube in London. We have, I think I counted today that Christian must be on his 10th or 11th visit to Tampa, and we have prepared a number of projects or collaborated with him on a number of projects, including the cyanotypes, which are a part of the subject of Noam Elcott's talk to you tonight. We're also working with him on a large scroll. I think now, Sarah, did you say it, tell me it was 50 feet? Is that right? Which will be exhibited at the Whitney Museum uh, coming up uh, this spring in an exhibition of his scores. So I do welcome you to come by Graphic Studio and see this impressive body of work, and we look forward to working with Christian on many more projects. Noam Elcott is going to write the uh, primary uh, catalog essay for a publication. It's really a book more than a catalog that we are collaborating with the Aldrich Museum to publish on uh, Christian Markley's cyanotypes produced here at Graphic Studio at the university. So Noam Elcott is the assistant professor of modern art at Columbia University. He specializes in the history of modern art and media in Europe and North America with an emphasis on interwar art, photography, and film. His research and teaching combine close visual analysis with media archaeology and critical theory. He also writes and teaches on contemporary art. Recent classes include seminars on Dada, on Futurism, and on art between photography and film. An undergraduate course, uh, Art Media, and the Avant-Garde, as well as Art Humanities. Noam Elcott was educated at Columbia University, where he received, received his uh, BA, summa cum laude, in 2000, and Princeton University, where he received his PhD in 2009. He is a recipient of a Fulbright, Mellon, DAAD, and other fellowships. Noam is currently at work on two book-length studies. The first charts the rise of cinema and media architecture through uh, close analysis of avant-garde cameraless photographs, photograms, and films, in particular those of Man Ray and Laszlo Moholy Naj. The second carries this project forward to the present with extended, with extended studies on Anthony McCall, Stan Douglas, James Welling, and Christian Markley, the London Filmmakers Co-op, and other contemporary artists. He has also curated comic film strips of film program and installation at the SUNY Graduate Center and uh, James Gallery. Noam Elcott has lectured widely, including recent and upcoming talks at the Tate Modern in London, the Bauhaus Universität in Weimar, and uh, ZKM Light Industry at X Initiative, I guess that's what those initials stand for, and Miller Theater at Columbia University and SUNY Graduate Center in New York. So um, I'm going to, I see Sarah has written a note on the top of this piece of paper to me to ask you all to be sure you've turned off your cell phones. So please do that and check if you haven't already done that. And uh, please 
help me welcome Noam Elcott for his lecture tonight. First of all, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming out um, for this. Thank you, Margaret, for the invitation uh, to come down here to see the incredible work taking place at the graphic studio. Um, I, I was prepared to be wowed, but was wowed beyond that. Um, and also thanks to uh, Christian, um, whose work really is the inspiration for this talk, and, and it's very much in dialogue with him um, that this, this talk has unfolded. How is the sound? Great. Photography today. The photo historian and theorist Lyle Rexer argues for the recent emergence of an antiquarian avant-garde encompassing not only antiquarian techniques, but also artisanal production, the hand of the artist, the unique photographic print. In short, the whole gamut of antiquarian values that were banished from the world of art by postmodern artists over the last several decades. The, uh, the irony especially is that they were banished from the art world often by way of photography, and Rexer argues for an antiquarian avant-garde that will return these values precisely to the realm of photography. Indeed, Rexer posits two opposing camps in the realm of photography, an antiquarian avant-garde that cares for the medium of photography in the age of its digital obsolescence, and a postmodern avant-garde that uses photography as a little more than documentation, such that any snapshot will do. We might picture this battle as one between Cindy Sherman, seen on the right in two of her untitled film stills, a series composed around 1980 whose intellectual brilliance is matched only by its technical indifference, or so Rexer would have us believe, and Chuck Close's recent turn to daguerreotypes, the first public form of photography announced already in 1839, two meticulous and recent exemplars of which are seen on the left. Uh, the top, of course, is Chuck Close himself, a self-portrait, the bottom, Cindy Sherman. On the right, Sherman assumes roles not out of specific B-movies, but rather out of a collective media unconscious. The final products are, photo are photographs, but the images belong to a media sphere dominated by film and advertising. They are no less at home on the internet, one could say, than they are in a gallery or museum. Fast forward 20 years. On the left, we are confronted with searing glimpses into the very souls of the photographer Chuck Close and his subject, Cindy Sherman. Or rather, what we see on screen are impoverished reproductions of the original daguerreotypes. For as is well known, daguerreotypes are unique positives whose nearly magical qualities cannot be transferred or reproduced. They're backed on silver. So they're, only, they're, they're literally mirrors with a memory. I mean, you can, they, they reflect back at you and have a life-like quality that certainly doesn't translate in reproduction and projection. Sherman's untitled film stills are multiples without originals, in every sense of the terms. She is in every image, but her presence is nowhere to be found. Her daguerreotype portrait not only bears the magisterial technical facility for which Chuck Close is renowned, but also the shallow depth of field that has become his portraiture calling card in any medium. If Cindy Sherman is the poster child of postmodernism, Chuck Close, we are told, belongs to an antiquarian avant-garde. Perhaps it is this allegiance that helps us understand Close's witty observation that the history of art, at least as it's taught in school and presented in lectures like this one, should actually be called the history of slides. <laughs> Not original works of art, but cheap, serviceable reproductions. This dichotomy, of course, is a false one. And no better refutation of it exists than Memento, Survival of the Fittest. Composed in 2008 by contemporary artist Christian Marclay, sitting here, 
This monumental cyanotype stretches out before us nearly four feet tall and eight feet wide. This is quite nearly life size. Its deep Prussian blue and bright white flares conjure many associations, not least a tropical reef, an abstract expressionist canvas, or the morning after the party, allusions to which I will return. But the title implies that the work is a memento to survival of the fittest, presumably not the social Darwinist term coined by Herbert Spencer, but rather the 1995 single by hip-hop duo Mop, Mob Deep, or a 1975 jazz funk album recorded by the Headhunters, a memento, that is, to the music once held on the tape housed in plastic cassettes, visible at the bottom of the image, or perhaps a memento to the cassettes themselves. What we're looking at is a cyanotype, I'll return to the process at the end, um, of actual audio cassettes and the tape pulled out of them and streamed down. For if cassette tapes, Sony Walkman, and boomboxes ruled many a music scene in the 1980s, they've been reduced to so much rubbish today. Musical detritus, of course, is precisely where Christian Marclay began his career. That track, Jukebox Capriccio, was recorded some 25 years ago. At the time, I was already thinking about sound. This was 1978. So begins Christian Marclay's recent account of his gramophonic epiphany more than three decades ago. 
I was living in Brookline, Massachusetts, he continues, while walking to art school on a heavily trafficked street a block away from my apartment, I found a record on the pavement. Cars were driving over it. It was a Batman record, a children's story with sound effects. I borrowed one of the turntables from school to listen to the record. It was heavily damaged and skipping, but was making these interesting loops and sounds because it was filled with sound effects. I just sat there, listening to some kind of spark happened. Listening, and some kind of spark happened. Just the fact that I picked it up was significant of the cultural difference. If I had grown up in the US, I wouldn't have thought twice about seeing a record on the street. That's what surprised me about American culture, its excess, the prevalence of so much waste. When I first came to the United States, it was a common sight to see broken records on the street. It took away the preciousness of the object. Marquette pursued these skips, loops, and sounds through orchestrated and improvisational ma manipulations of the gramophone, a technique made popular through parallel developments in hip hop. Marquette's may be the only music career launched by a broken record. Marquette has revived the scene of destruction in a number of installations, most notably, perhaps, in Footsteps from 1989, seen on the left, Echo and Narcissus, 1992, seen at the top right, um, and at the bottom right is a, a recent installation at PS1, um, just this past year, uh, where he lined the gallery floor with thousands of 12-inch vinyl records and compact discs, uh, respectively. The vinyl records of footsteps contain the sounds of Marquay's footsteps mixed with the quick syncopations of Dan tap dancers' pedal patter. Invited to meander throughout the gallery, viewers added the physical imprints of their own footsteps to the mix. The footprints imprinted the mechanically reproduced records with a unique layer of skips and loops, as if to reestablish the preciousness of the object counterintuitively through their partial destruction. Fittingly, each of the 3,500 records was packaged and sold at the close of the exhibition. An addition of 1,000 was signed, and 100 copies were signed and numbered. Echo and Narcissus took advantage of the reflective surfaces of compact discs and transformed their capacity for sonic regurgitation into a capacity for visual reflection. This transmutation from the oral to the optical register, already hinted at in the work's title, is endemic to Marquet's oeuvre and perhaps its most important structural operation. Unlike the records of footsteps, the 15,000 CDs used for Echo and Narcissus were summarily dumped. They can be installed and experienced, but not owned as individual objets d'art. Between the 1989 exhibition of footsteps and the first iteration of Echo and Narcissus in 1992, Markley began experimenting with cameraless photographs or photograms. Made through the interposition of objects between a light source and a photosensitive surface, photograms are produced without recourse to lenses or cameras. The most famous and widely disseminated form of cameras photography are x-ray images. Just think of putting an elbow onto a, 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 an x-ray tray and it's exposed to x-ray radiation without any camera right, whatsoever. Uh, the form ends up looking exactly like you know, an avant-garde photograph depending on exactly how you, you put, the, put the object on, on the plate. Known at least since the 1830s when William Henry Fox Talbot placed leaves and lace on photosensitive paper and exposed them to direct sunlight, cameraless photography has been practiced by amateurs, children, scientists, and others from the invention of photography through to the present. Avant-garde artists, in particular Man Ray and Laszlo Maholi Naj, first explored the technique in the years following World War I. We're looking at a uh, photo, the rayograph. Uh, Man Ray named them after himself. Uh, we're looking at rayograph number two from Champ Delicieux, or Delicious Fields, um, a limited edition set of rayographs that he produced in 1922 with an introduction by Tristan Zara. Um, you'll notice very peculiarly uh, there, there's a reversal of form and ground within this, within this rayograph. So most of the piece are light forms on a dark ground, which is what we saw in 
uh, Christian's first cyanotype. That's what you would expect from a rheograph, but the center uh, with, the, with the comb is actually a dark form on a light ground. There's a reversal that took place, and it's still something of a scholarly mystery as to how exactly Man Ray affected this reversal. It's not a mystery we're going to solve tonight. I'm sorry. The critical response to the introduction of photograms into avant-garde discourse in 1922 was split. On the one hand, Man Ray's rheographs were advertised in terms of their artistic pretensions. I quote, this is the first time that photography is placed at the same level as original pictorial works. That's from the advertising bulletin from 1922. Jean Cocteau, the polymath quickly understood that their artistic value resided not only in their suppression of overt mimesis in favor of at least partial abstraction, but also the fact that each print is unique and is no more reproducible than a drawing or a painting. Your prints, he wrote Man Ray in an open letter from 1922, are so precious because there exists only one of each. Marclay has always been attuned to this dimension of cameraless photography. Every photogram he has created is a unique original. Indeed, in his very, his very first series, comprised of photograms of broken records, immediately invoke his gramophonic epiphany, and with it, the desire to restore the preciousness of the object, taken away not by technological reproduction, so much as excessive and wasteful consumption. As its title suggests, Broken Record in Five Pieces from 1990 is composed of the fragments of a single gramophone record. This is obviously not in five pieces, so it must be in three pieces. Um, but rather than attempt to make it whole again, Mar Marclay restores the preciousness of the record through its photographic transposition. If in footsteps, Marclay succeeded in creating unique uh, recordings from a cache of 3,500 identical records, broken record in three pieces transforms an anonymous and disposable record into a unique composition in black and white. Your records, Cocteau might have said to Marclay, are precious because there exi exists only one photogram of each. There is, however, another facet to these images. If Cocteau was among the first to address Man Ray publicly after his rediscovery of cameraless photography, Tristan Zara, the irascible daughter ringleader, penned the introduction to Champ de Lisieux, the first limited edition of folio of rheographs. In opposition to Cocteau, Zara had little interest in preciousness. And art? Well, as Zara joyfully pronounced, let's speak of art for a moment. Yes, art. I know a gentleman who makes excellent portraits. This gentleman is a camera. Like Marcel Duchamp, who that same year famously answered a questionnaire on the artistic significance of photography with the rebuke, you know exactly what I think about photography. I would like to see it make people despise painting until something else will make photography itself unbearable. There we are. Zara had little patience for questions of art and artists. He believed that the rheograph freed beauty from the hegemony of a select elite. Cameraless photographs, after all, are the simplest of aesthetic products. Markley's first series of photograms are the simplest of photographs, black and white in a binary sense, that is, nothing by way of tonal gradations, a layout that is neither aleatory nor composed, but rather demonstrational literal to the degree that the title nearly provides a complete and accurate description, a one-to-one -one correspondence between referent and image in regard to size and transparency. If there is beauty in the work, it is to be found in the record itself, the contrast between its rounded and jagged edges, the fragmentary quality that makes it appear like pieces of a puzzle, its brokenness and fragility. For Zara, the broken record itself would have clearly sufficed, and if there is a need to record the record, cameraless photography succeeds in an artless transposition that captures the beauty of the material rather than, than the invention of the artist. Zara's description of Man Ray's rheographs apply perfectly well to Marclay's first photograms and also to Echo and Narcissus. As a mirror throws back an image without effort, as an echo throws back a voice without asking why. The beauty of matter belongs to no one. From now on, it is a product of physics and chemistry. 
From the very beginning, Mark Clay's photograms were torn between preciousness and detritus. A ghostly white shadow of a forearm and hand reaches toward a gaseous disk hovering in the darkness of a 2004 untitled photogram by Mark Clay. If the circular form is quickly deciphered as the cameraless traces of a gramophone record, perhaps the signature form within Marquay's vast and assorted aesthetic output, the hand, presumably that of the artist, arrives on the scene laden with meaning and controversy. The hand of the artist, the ductus, or traces of manual, literally pertaining to hands, the traces of manual labor, was variously the object of modernist veneration and scorn. After the First World War, avant-garde movements from Dada to constructivism worked to eliminate the residue of individual creativity in favor of more objective, or at least less personal, modes of expression. In the early 1920s, Bauhaus master Laszlo Moholinaj envisioned paintings that could be ordered by telephone in order to sever once and for all the bonds between the hand of the artist and the work of art. He gave form to this ethos in a mid-1920s photogram in which the cameraless traces of a paintbrush and hand are visibly, are plainly visible. Photograms, as Moholinaj dubbed this new avant-garde practice, were a form of light painting which required neither hand nor brush. Excised from their creative role, the two former staples of artistic, artistic expression could be placed summarily on the photosensitive paper as it was exposed to directly to light, that is, at precisely the moment the image is created. The hand and the brush are in the image because they're no longer necessary for the production of the image. Cameraless photography would, in the hands of avant-garde artists, finally do away with the last residues of romantic romantic individualism and expression. Where cameras did away with the art of painted portrait, cameraless photography usurped abstraction from the daydream of painters. And yet the hand of the artist proved more resilient than its most corrosive critics. At the time Tristan Zara singled out the cameraless photographs of Man Ray as deliverance from an, art, uh, from an arthritic practice of art, Jean Cocteau sung their praises to a very different tune. Your rheographic prints, he wrote, are the very objects themselves, not photographed through a camera lens, but by your poet's hand directly interposed between the light and sensitive paper. Denied its mastery over pigment and brushwork, the hand of the artist is resurrected through the poetic placement of objects on photosensitive paper. So which is it? The obsolescent hands of Maholinage displaced on the paper to highlight their ineffectuality, or those of Main Ray, among the artist's favorite puns, M-A-I-N is hand in French, present not in their aesthetic expression, but poetic selection. This is the question one immediately faces when confronted with Marquay's lustrous photogram of an arm and a record. Is this a hand rendered obsolete by the reproductive power of photography and phonography, or a hand whose poetic authority derives from the selection and placement of objects and records. With even cursory knowledge of Marclay's career, Marclay was among the early pioneers of turntablism in the early 1980s. There can be little doubt this is the hand of a DJ. But what is the hand doing? Turned counterclockwise, the image aligns itself with, contem with contemporaneous photograms in which a DJ's hands manipulate or spin the records, repeat key passages, fabricate new rhythms, and produ produce scratch sounds heard nowhere else. Read in relation to another 2004 image, the ghostly hand may be of a far more mundane variety, ready to take hold of the record only to return it to its protective sleeve. But in this untitled cameraless image, Marquay includes no record sleeve and orients the image perpendicular to a traditional DJ turntable station. The result is less gramophone record than ethereal discus released into the darkness of signification. 
Marquet's reconfiguration of the hand of the artist opens not only the on opens on, onto not only the broadest histories of Western representation, but also a specific avant-garde theory of technological media. For as, Mark, for as Mark Lay tells it, his interest in cameraless photography began with a photograph of a gra gramophone reproduced by Maholi Naj in his mid-1920s classic book, Painting, Photography, Film. Where Mark Lay often highlights the gulf that separates visual from acoustic art along with her incongruous intersections, Maholi Naj's text unifies the two practices beneath an overarching theory that he named production reproduction. And it is here that Maholi Naj first explored the possibility of cameraless photography. Before ever venturing into the darkroom or laying his hands on photosensitive paper, Maholi Naj laid out a theory of technological media and their place in aesthetic practice. He argues that an in that art is an instrument in the develop excuse me he argues that art is an instrument in the development of the sensory faculties and that reproductive technologies must be opened on to their own productive ends that is rather than merely reproduce the sights and sounds of the world artists must explore the expressive potential unique to each medium he delineates the productive uses of three media in particular gramophones, photo photographs, and films. It is here, in the nexus of productive phonography and photography, that the seed to Markley's cameraless work was planted. In the early 1920s, Maholi Naj envisioned a new form of musical composition through the direct manipulation of the gramophone record groove. What he called an ABC of the groove would replace all other instruments, create a graphic language of composition, eliminate the need to reproduce music via amateurish interpretation, and enable the distribution of sound without cumbersome orchestras. Productive phonography, according to Maholi Naj, would surpass all reproductions of extant sounds. What is more, this alphabet of the record groove would be enabled by photographic enlargements of gramophones. So he imagined taking photographs, micro photographs, of actual record grooves, blowing them up so that you can see the actual wave, and then using that or reproducing that wave to create very specific sounds. Um, interestingly, this would never be realized in the realm of the phonograph, but it would be um, realized uh, in the realm of the optical soundtrack. So that in the, around the late 1920s and early 1930s, right as sound film uh, is introduced, uh, individuals, Maholi Naj including, um, among others, uh, would draw the optical soundtrack so that you could see what triangle sounded like. You could, in fact, Maholi Naj would write, you could see what your profile, or you could hear what your profile sounds like. You could draw your profile repeatedly onto the optical soundtrack and run it through um, a sound film projector to hear your own profile. Of the three media technologies addressed in Maholi Naj's early text, only photography found a productive outlet in his practice. It is high time, Maholi asserted, that we employ mirrors and lenses to produce creative light effects or momentary plays of light rather than merely reproduce images of the outside world. To do so, as Maholi Naj made clear in both theory and practice the following year, we must do away with the camera and experiment with the direct exposure of photosensitive surfaces. In other words, the same theoretical assertions that bore the photogram also called for the productive use of the gramophone. Maholi Naj mustered no substantive attempt at productive photography. He neither mastered an ABC of the groove nor anticipated its ultimate realization, as media theorist Friedrich Kittler observed, among New York disc jockeys who turned the esoteric graphisms of Maholi Naj into the everyday experience of scratch music. Christian Marclay was among those DJs, and it was in, this, it was in his turntablism that Marclay broke out of Maholi Naj's binary conception of production, reproduction, and detonated the whole complex of modernist preoccupations. Early tracks like Jukebox Capriccio, which we heard, um, or Dust Breeding and Groove, 
um, those latter two, both from 1982, reference the historical avant-garde, but depart entirely from a holy nausea's fantasy of a gramophonic alphabet. Rather than manipulate the record groove on a microscopic level in order to create an utterly new language of sound, Marclay manipulated multiple records on a complex turntable station in order to mix fragments of recorded music, reproductions, with sounds that derive uniquely from the properties of turntablism, production. In his music, Marclay explodes the production-reproduction divide by making productive use of reproductions. More than acoustic montage, but Far from an elementary language of the groove, Marclay helped inaugurate a sonic practice of reproductive production or productive reproduction, where modernists sought out elementary properties, universal languages, and the essence of a medium. Postmodernists like Marclay have embraced contingent attributes, local dialects, and as Rosalind Krauss has dubbed it, the post-medium condition. Marclay's oeuvre is not limited to a single medium or practice. Music, performance, appropriation, collage, photography, ready-made, and video, along with practices and objects that defy simple categorization, are all part of his expansive and generous approach to art. But where other corpuses have disintegrated into eclecticism, Marclay's focus on the acoustic, in particular the gramophonic, has opened up a new set of aesthetic conventions which lend coherence to his practice without falling into essentialist explorations of a medium. Without these conventions and references, a viewer confronted with this untitled 2004 image would be at a loss, blissfully lost, to decipher the curved pattern of lines running a meter across the surface of the image. What is the meaning of the dark band that tears across the top third of the photogram? How to explain the moiré pattern that appears at irregular intervals? To the viewer uninitiated in the art of Christian Marclay, the untitled photogram is an exercise in abstraction. To photogram aficionados, however, the image appears at first like an extension, if not an unwitting repetition, of avant-garde photographs made with and without a camera. Photographs of gramophones date back at least to Man Ray's rayographs from the early 1930s. Indeed, a flyer from, for a 1932 exhibition at the Julian Levy Gallery in New York announced the terms by which Man Ray transposed the inscription of sound into an inscription in light. And one of the lines here could describe Christian's work perfectly but we're actually talking about Man Ray for a moment in 1932. His abstractions have opened a field which is far from being fully explored as yet. He has discovered that the most familiar objects can be transposed in a domain where they escape their own utilitarianism. A pair of scissors ceases to be a thing that cuts. A gramophone record is forever silenced, but beautiful spectrums have been made apparent. Several years prior, Maholinaj published a microphotograph of gramophonic grooves, Caruso's high C, according to the caption, in his 1929 book, From Material to Architecture, his summary of his Bauhaus teaching later translated famously as The New Vision. Without making claims of direct influence, Marclay was unaware of these images when he embarked on his own series of photograms, a distinct formal parallel Parallelism is plainly visible. You'll pardon my cold, which I apparently brought down from New York. Of course, where Man Ray contextualizes the moiré pattern within recognizable images of records, Marclay's fragment is rendered virtually abstract. And if Moholinage still employed a camera-based photography, Marclay attains his close-up of record grooves without recourse to a camera. But these formal and technical differences appear inconsequential in light of the dramatic morphologic proximity and shared underlying fascination with the attributes of a specific medium. It seems that the many hands in Marclay's photograms are not those of the artist or his ghost, but the hands of the DJ mixing his favorite tracks from the historical avant-garde. Rather than break with modernism, Marclay appears to replay it. 
And yet, Marquet's photographs of enlarged record grooves appear all but indistinguishable from Aholinage's earlier photograph only when reproduced in print or projected on screen as it is now. Just as slide comparisons are the bread and butter of art historians, remember the history of slides, books were the historic home from Aholinage's photographs, photograph of a record groove. It was reproduced in the pages of every edition of the new vision and never measured more than 18 centimeters by 10 centimeters. The photograph is one of many published or exhibited, but not necessarily produced, by Maholinage as part of his kaleidoscopic demonstration of the new vision enabled by photography and other technological media. In fact, the visual analogies and puns established by Maholinage by, by Maholinage in books like Painting, Photography, Film, and in exhibitions like FIFO, the film and photography exhibition launched in Stuttgart in 1929, function only when reference are reduced to comparably sized black and white photographs. In its original setting, Maholinage analogized the photograph photographing enlargement of a gramophone grooves to a rye field photographed from a plane and ripples on the surface of the water similarly photographed from above. All these things appear indistinguishable or at least closely analogous in the pages of a book. Or in this comparison in, uh, from Maholinage's painting photography film, a sedge of cranes in flight is analogized with an echelon of fighter planes. Natural scale is abolished in favor of the uniform dimensions and colors of the printed page. We are not far from Chuck Close's history of slides. In other words, the visual harmonies established by New Vision photographers were precisely those of the photographic print. Markley's photograms, on the contrary, measure roughly 100 centimeters by 75 centimeters unframed. That is the one of the gramophone grooves, the abstract image. Each unique image must be hung on the wall. Any dialogue with the new vision is coincidental. Where Maholinage's abstract patterns unearth the crystalline structures viewed from an airplane and through a microscope, Marquay's abstractions are in clear dialogue with the proto-minimalist reductions of Frank Stella or the geometric precisions of Bridget Riley. Marquay is less an advocate of a new photographic vision than a chronicler of that old thing, art, as Roland Barthes called. Nowhere is this more visible than in his most recent series of large-scale cameraless cyanotypes. The current work grew out of a 2001 series of 25 photograms, each almost exactly one square foot, where ribbons and knots of magnetic tape pulled out of audio cassettes leaves white web-like patterns on a matte black ground. Like the earlier series, the current work consists largely of unspooled reams of cassette tape, but the two series ultimately are more different than similar in materials, colors, orientation, scale, and historical reference. Recent works like untitled Guns N' Roses' Sonic Youth and two mixtapes, um, that was not it, and, oh, I don't, I don't have those slides, I'm sorry, and mashup, uh, two, cassette, uh, two cassettes diptych, those slides somehow got lost, apologies, um, I will note that these are not uh, uh, these are not cassette tapes out of Christian's personal collection, but rather uh, tapes he picked up from local flea markets. So if you are uh, suddenly lost all faith in Christian Markway because he's a huge Guns N' Roses fan, weep not. Um, recent works are composed not only of magnetic tape but also of the audio cassettes from which they are pulled. In place of the black ground of silver gelatin, Marquay mobilized the striking Prussian blues of cyanotypes. Moreover, where Marquay's black and white tape photograms lack any clear orientation, his recent cyanotypes strongly imply production in either the vertical, as you see here, or horizontal position, the all overs, of which I don't have images, but I did just see today, and they're extraordinary, um, clearly right, refer to the, hor the horizontal position just as much as these clearly inscribe the forces of gravity within them. If the 2001 black and white photograms are most legible in terms of avant-garde cameraless photography, the recent cyanotypes, in particular works like Memento, Survival of the Fittest, that's what we're seeing here, 
which measures nearly four feet by eight feet, are clearly in dialogue with post-World War II American painting. The white and blue bands that sweep down and across the broad surface of Memento immediately conjure the ethereal veils of color pouring down the canvases of Morris Lewis or other color field painters. And I've recently found out that they even have tried to pour down some of um, the emulsion um, for the cyanotypes, pour it down the page. Uh, the effects thus far have been very interesting. Uh, I think I'm more enthusiastic than Christian is about it, but uh, there, the, the dialogue with, with Morris Lewis, who poured, literally poured paint down the canvas in these beautiful ribbons of, of color is, uh, is that much more explicit. But the dominant reference is clearly elsewhere. In Memento, Perfect catenaries and irregular tangles, ranging from piercing white to the lightest azure squiggles, sweep across the image. We are thrust before a forest of light, or better still, into a tropical pool, peering up from the depths toward the sunlight that breaks the plane of the water. But as our eyes float down to the bottom of the image, where broken cassettes litter this ocean floor and transform it into a dirty and abandoned dance hall, the streaming ribbons of light transmogrify into party streamers well after the end of the party. And yet the ethereal light, stripped of clear naturalistic or supernatural illusions, pulls itself out of the refuse and shines no less brightly for its pathetic associations, a transubstantiation without the miracle. This oscillation between the sublime and the grotesque has no stronger American resonance than in the works of Jackson Pollock, here number 1A from 1948. In his hands, house paint dripped onto unstretched canvas, laid out on the ground, became fields of color, an intricate topography for the wanderings of the eye and the self. And yet the very same Pollock left handprints, cigarette butts, and tacks lodged in the viscous globs of paint that pooled on the surface of his images. No longer the hand of the artist articulated through the traces of his paintbrush, but the animalistic hand of a man at the precipice of an existential abyss. In Memento, Marclay attempts to redo Pollock without the existential self. Lest these references seem too distant, uh, here's a little Cy Twombly. Um, lest these references seem too distant, one need only turn to Robert Rauschenberg's brief flirtation with large-scale cameraless cyanotypes in which he outlined the form of his then-wife, Susan Weil, onto mural-sized sheets of photosensitive paper. You could see the two in action. That hand and that sunlight lamp um, is of Ra Robert Rauschenberg. On the right is not the same image, obviously. Rauschenberg outlined the form of his then wife Susan Weil onto mural sized sheets of photosensitive paper. Like American action painting, Rauschenberg's blueprints from 1949 to 51 turned the canvas or paper into an arena for action, but one in which light replaces the brush and direct traces of the depicted body replace the hand of the artist. And going counterclockwise, we have Jack the Dripper on the top right. On the top left, uh, Robert Rauschenberg, and on the bottom, a recent photograph of Christian Marclay. Um, the, uh, the parallel, especially with the, the viscous paint, is just extraordinary. That's obviously tape, right, pulled out of, of the cassettes. Marclay's memento invokes these precedents neither in awestruck veneration nor in violent appropriation, but rather like damaged records found on the pavement. And yet it is not the explicit dialogue with abstract expressionism that leads to the profound success of works like Memento, nor is it the implicit dialogue with the photograms of the historical avant-garde. Instead, it is the jump, Walter Benjamin might call it a tiger's leap, over the 20th century to the origins of photography, to the cyanotype technique. Invented by Sir John Herschel, in 1842, in a gentleman scientist, 
Three years after Daguerre and Talbot made their inventions public, cyanotypes are the material and historical backdrop against which Marclay brings his cassette tapes to life and mourns their death. Historically, the use of cyanotypes can be divided into three main phases, depending on how you want to count them. Initially, it was taken up by a small elite of botanists for plant illustrations, the most famous example of which was Anna Atkins' photograph of British algae, uh, British algae in illustrated natural history produced artisanally between 1843 and 1854 and distributed exclusively to a small circle of friends. These are four pages from what was initially a bound book. Um, and each one, uh, in, in the, the labels are also part of the cyanotype. So every one, this is a natural history um, where every different algae is, is named with its proper scientific designation and reproduced um, in beautiful Prussian blue. The Prussian blue of the photographic process coinc uh, coincided brilliantly with the subject matter at hand, sea algae. When laid out across a table, a 2008 series of cameraless tape cyanotypes by Marclay called automatic drawing, and I believe they were for the graphic studio subscribers, um, Laid out across a table, automatic drawing is reminiscent of the pages of Atkins' photographs of British algae, as if Marquay were a natural historian of media technologies. The comparison has more than pseudomorphological value. In each instance, no two prints are identical. Even when produced en masse, each print differs slightly from the others as it derives not from a common negative, but rather from the singular encounter between an object sea algae, cassette tapes, whatever, and photosensitive paper, an encounter made particularly easy and inexpensive by the very simple nature of cyanotypes. Cyanotypes require but two chemical compounds along with sunlight and water. As our child Bailey disdainfully remarked a century ago, the cyanotype survives, quote, as the Darwinians tell us some of the lower forms of life survives from the extreme simplicity of its structure. Um, it should be noted that cyanotypes were disdained almost universally by any photographer with artistic aspirations for the majority of its history. Indeed, this facility for, the reprodu for reproduction accounts for its sole per purchase on the popular imagination today. After 30 years of near oblivion, after its initial exploitation by figures like Anna Atkins, and to a much lesser degree, Herschel, who actually had very little interest in being a photographer, cyanotypes were reinvented by entrepreneurs who suppressed Herschel's name and formula, as well as his, his name for the procedure. In place of a gentleman or gentlewoman's scientific hobby, the ferro-prussiate process, as it was soon christened, was employed for photocopying plans of any kind. In a word, blueprints. By the end of the 19th century, blueprint paper was manufactured industrially. In 1918, a 30-foot by one-yard roll of cyanotype paper cost as little as one pound six cents, which was a very good thing because plans for a battleship consumed some 11,000 square feet of blueprint paper. Cheap and easy, if not quite beloved, blueprints remain the dominant industrial reproduction process for 80 years. At the time that Rauschenberg was making his cyanotypes, blueprints were still widely used. The current artistic revival of cyanotypes largely ignores the history of cheap, industrial, omnipresent blueprints in favor of the artisanal practice of Atkins and her cohorts. The antiquarian avant-garde works to raise a lowly reproduction technology into the exalted halls of art. Not so Christian Markley. As the philosopher and cultural critic Theodore Adorno implies, the problem with popular culture is not that it's not high enough, but rather that it's not low enough, the popular being consumed by higher forces of the culture industry. The rock bands referenced in Marquay's titles, not only Sonic Youth, but also Guns N' Roses and Millie Vanilli, <laughs> accompanied almost always by a plethora of unidentified mixtapes, are not elevated so much as smashed, their innards ripped out and put on display. 
These cheap audio reproductions are then assembled and reproduced on the 19th century's cheapest mode of photographic reproductions, blueprints. Marclay does not redeem cyanotypes and audio cassettes by making them art. Rather, he redeems modern art from Man, from Man Ray all the way through Jackson Pollock by lowering them to the level of cheap, serviceable reproductions. The history of slides, indeed. Thank you.